I don't know about you, but I needed that worship, and I'm very thankful for uh, the great uh, seriousness with which they took uh, leading in worship and uh, appreciate the songs that they chose to sing. Building our life upon that one foundation is Jesus Christ, and I'm thankful that you're here. Uh, just a couple of reminders, going to try to let you know something the first of the week about what's going to take place as far as uh, things are going as a church. I appreciate your patience. Uh, it's not been easy for me. Uh, I know it can't be easy for you to kind of see where things are going. There's so much misinformation out there. One, one time you got facts here and somebody else says this and part of the people uh, don't want to uh, go out and some want to go out and, and uh, the all kinds of things that are going on and we've been prayerfully trying to make decisions that are best for uh, you as well as uh, will enable us to, to be as safe as we can. So I hope you'll be praying for that. I'm going to be giving that out sometime the first of the week. On Thursday is the National Day of Prayer. We usually gather and uh, have that, and uh, what we're going to do this time is live stream that. Uh, I'll be on at 12 noon with that, and uh, I sure do appreciate that. And I would even say that if you got a phone where you can uh, catch that, uh, if you want to come up here and walk around and be praying around this church uh, here, or uh, bringing you a chair and sitting out in the yard out there and praying, uh, you do that. Uh, you come and let that be a part of that and be praying together. And uh, I appreciate so very much that. And as we pray here at the beginning, I hope you'll re be remembering a brother Shaky who is so faithful to be on the camera. His mom, uh, up in her 90s, mid 90s, uh, left here last night in uh, early morning hours, actually after 1 a.m. And uh, she put up a great struggle uh, in that, but she's with the Lord this morning, her first Sunday in heaven. And so we're praising God for that, but at the same time mourning for Shaky and his family. So I hope you'll keep him in prayer as the days go by. Let's pray and we'll get started. Father, thank you so much for Jesus Christ and your love and your grace. God, I, I tell you, we, it, without you, I don't know how we, we make it. We turn to so many different things. It's just bizarre the things we can lean hard on when we're in need that end up really not being the best for us and in the long run being more destructive. I thank you, dear God, that in Christ we know that you have our best interest at hand. I praise you, Father, that for every person that is watching right now, participating, that have been worshiping in song. I thank you for every one of the musicians and singers that came and uh, led us today. May, your ble may you bless them and their families. And I pray, Father, again, thank you for everybody else that's watching today. And I pray that somehow your word will speak truth into their life that they need. And God, you will help them to be better for... Uh, listening and letting you work in their life. I commit the reading to the scripture. I commit all that is said and done unto you. May your name be glorified in the end, and I praise you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. I've been talking for the last two Sundays about marriage, and uh, I think that's a very needful topic. The Bible talks about it. It really does. Uh, and I know that some people have told me and uh, they'd love to come and sit down and get counsel. Uh, and I've had a couple of people who've just said, well, this uh, sh in sheltering has just caused my marriage to go kaplunk. But really, the crisis that we've been in doesn't cause much of anything. It just reveals cracks that are already there and can amplify them. It's like an amplifier, uh, the things that we're already dealing with, and it makes it much worse, I will agree. And so uh, I want to kind of review the last two weeks for just a moment before I get into what I'm going to say today. And so I appreciate very much. Uh, this was uh, the last two weeks I've come from uh, Ephesians uh, chapter 5, uh, beginning in verse 18 and reading through verse 21, which I said is actually the introduction 
to the passage of Scripture where he talks about wives and husbands and going into verse 6 for children. And uh, I tried to say at the very beginning and did say that only if you have learned to serve others by the power of the Holy Spirit will you ever have the power to face the challenges of marriage. And so when Paul writes this, these few verses prior to uh, what he says about wives and husbands and children and parents, he is telling us, first of all, he's speaking to those who have recognized that they are a part of that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, that uh, there's none that have done good, no, not one, and they have come to that realization of that truth, that conviction that they can't save themselves and therefore have uh, can't save themselves and they have repented. That means they've changed their mind about the things they may have thought were too bad to be forgiven and the things that were so good they thought would get them into heaven and realize I just need to let go of all that and turn instead and trust in Jesus Christ as my Savior and Lord. And when we do, when we realize that Jesus uh, atoned, God was on that cross, shed his blood for the forgiveness of our sins to reconcile us to God that we might have peace with God, God the Holy Spirit comes and seals us with the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Now the, we are the righteousness of Christ. It's not about what we have done, but it's what Christ has done for us. And he lives in us. The Holy Spirit seals us, puts a seal of our redemption uh, right up to the day we go into heaven. And he is living in us. And ours is to yield our lives on a daily basis to the Spirit. If we live in the Spirit, Galatians says, we will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. And in this passage, introductory passage in chapter 5 of Ephesians, Paul says, don't be controlled, don't be drunk with alcohol, wine, but instead be filled with the Holy Spirit. And it's in that relationship that we now have through Christ with the Father and being filled with daily, because that word says, when he says be filled with the Spirit, is actually uh, being filled with the Spirit. It's an ongoing process of yielding ourselves to his leadership. It's only then that you and I will be fully furnished with what we need to face the challenges of marriage in general. Uh, and if you are filled with the Spirit, you will have all you need to be able to be the husband or wife that you need in serving one another. And the reason for that is, is because our example uh, of living life from the moment we trust Christ is Jesus himself. And I went back and pointed out that in John's gospel, we see Jesus who is Lord and Savior taking a bowl and a towel and washing the feet of his disciples, and he says, even as I've done to you, do unto others. He says, this is an example. And so because Christ humbled himself and became a servant and met our needs, even at the cost of his own life, now we are servants one to another. And the scripture says that over and over again. And we looked at, as we, as we were talking about that controversial passage of the husband being head and the wife submitting, which automatically we go that word submit, that really we have to look at that last verse uh, 21. It says submitting to one another in the fear of Christ. So while Paul writes that the husband is head of the wife, whatever that means, whatever that means, can't negate the fact that he is also his wife's brother in Christ. He is her bond servant, somebody who is serving her in Christ. And according to Galatians 5, 13, that husbands and wives must serve each other, give up themselves, give themselves up for one another. We're going to serve one another. That's what God intended for all of us. That's the general principle that he applies to the specifics of marriage, that in Christ, filled with the Holy Spirit, we're to serve one another. That is the key. 
And we learned last week that we fail at this because of our pride, our pride, our self-centeredness. We fail too often because we have believed the gospel with our head, but it is not operational in our lives. We, we believe it. Oh, yeah, I believe the word. I believe in Jesus. I believe this, but we never see it. It goes back to James. James says, show me your faith without works, and I'll show you my faith with work. He wasn't saying we work our way to salvation. He's saying if you really know Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, if you've been transformed by him, it will affect the way your life. It will be visible in the way that you live your life. And this is what Paul was saying here. The ability to serve another person requires the Holy Spirit in us because it's not a natural thing for us. Uh, and he is the spirit of truth. And he needs to take the gospel of Jesus Christ and, and drive it deep down into us uh, as it sprouts so that we are evidencing that we've been transformed by Christ in the way we live and the things we say and the things that we do. Self-centeredness, we talked about, is by its very character, it makes you and I blind to our own. In, in other words, we can be really hypersensitive and offended and even angered by the self-centeredness of others, pointed out very quickly. Our own self-centeredness blinds us to the fact that we are. And the result is, is, not that, uh, is not that good because we develop this destructive uh, cancer of self-pity and anger and despair uh, as our relationship is eaten away by that to, to nothing. So when we come to, our, come to a marriage, we bring all these different things in our background. All of the hurts and pains and the good things, the bad things, we bring all of that with us. And so when conflict occurs in a family, and inevitably it will at some point, wounded memories from our past sometimes can sabotage us more times than not. They prevent us from doing the normal day-to-day -day, uh, uh, work of repenting of our sin and forgiveness and extending grace to that loving husband or wife uh, in our marriage. And that's crucial to make a marriage really go. And the reason why that is so is in our woundedness, that woundedness is alone makes us self-centered. Uh, it's not hard to see that in somebody else, uh, but we're always the last to see it in ourselves. And I talked about how our hurts and our wounds can become so entrenched in our self-centeredness and make it even more uh, uh, stuck in us, if you will. And when you point out when you point out selfish behavior to a wounded person, what happens is that person will say, "Well, maybe so, but you don't understand what it's like to have gone through I've, what I've gone through. You don't know what it's like to experience what I've experienced." And so I was talking about the wound that we feel, the woundedness helps us justify our behavior uh, in that. And so the Christian principle that needs to be at work is spirit-generated spirit selflessness. The Holy Spirit in us produces a selflessness. And that's not thinking of yourself, or not, not thinking less of yourself or more of yourself, but thinking of yourself less. We're just not thinking about ourselves. And then I ended last week by saying all of this serving one another, all of that submitting and serving one to another, the general principle applied to the marriage relationship, should be done out of the fear of the Lord. And I define fear as an overwhelming awe of how great God is and how good he has been to us in saving us and loving us and extending his grace that it just almost is overwhelming and that in and of itself helps us desire to, to be service to others that he might get glory. Uh, and I talked about that it's only out of that fear, that overwhelming awe of the Lord Jesus will we ever be freed 
to serve one another. And so today I want to I want to look at Ephesians 5:31 to begin with, which is a quote really of Genesis 2:24. And it says this, for this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and the two shall become one flesh now that that is god's intention then in genesis the very beginning it's the, it is his intention even now and i've taken this time to try to do this introduction because he's talking about two Christians about what marriage is uh, in and through Jesus Christ, being filled with the Spirit. Um, and so we've got to keep that in mind as you hear what I'm going to say. Now, throughout my uh, being a pastor, you know, you, one of the things that we do as pastors are we're called upon to marry people. And I've had people, young middle-aged and even older, uh, in their 70s, uh, as a matter of fact, couples come to me and uh, they will say something like this, why in the world do we need a piece of paper in order to love one another? Talking about a marriage license. We, we start talking about, you know, this legalities. Uh, and I've had more than one husband uh, and one more than one wife say, I don't need a piece of paper to love her or to love him. It only complicates things. That's what you hear. I don't need that piece of paper. And like I said, I've heard that a lot. But what, what's happening there is that the person who says this or the persons who say this is using a cultural definition of love that is based upon the, uh, the assumption that love is in its core, in its essence, a particular kind of feeling, a particular kind of emotion. That's what that means. I, th that, that paper just complicates the feeling that I have. And, and so when they say, what, uh, you know, I don't, I don't need this piece of paper to love one another, what they're really saying is I, uh, I feel romantic passion for you. I feel this romantic emotion for you. And the piece of paper doesn't enhance that at all, and it may hurt it. And so what they're doing is they're measuring love mainly by how emotionally, how emotionally desirous of you or uh, that you are or they were for somebody else's return of affection. Uh, and in, in that sense, under their definition, a cultural definition, they're right. Because that marriage license, that piece of paper will do little to nothing directly to add to the feeling, the passion, the romantic desires. But when the Bible speaks of love, it measures it primarily not by how much you receive or how much you want to receive, but how much you're willing to give of yourself to someone. Now, let me say that again. You see, the Bible speaks of love. It measures that love primarily not by how much you want to receive, but how much you're willing to give of yourself to someone. How much of yourself... How much are you willing to lose for the sake of this person that you say you, you want to be with? How much are you willing to lose for that person? How much of your freedom are you willing to forsake? How, how much of your precious time, how much of your precious emotion, how much of your precious resources are you willing to invest in this person? Those are the questions. And for that, the marriage vow is not just helpful, in, in a lot of ways, it's like a test uh, if, because in so, many, in, in so many cases when one person says to another, I love you, but I don't want to ruin it by getting married, that person really means I love you enough to close, I don't love you enough to close off all my options 
I don't love you enough to give myself to you thoroughly. That's what they're really saying. To say I don't need a piece of paper to love you is basically to say my love for you has not reached the marriage level. Not according to who Christ is and what the Bible says. Now one of the most wildly, uh, widely held beliefs in our culture today uh, is that romantic love is all important in order to have a full life, but it doesn't always last. You, you got to have this romantic love in order to have a full life, but that doesn't last. And so the second related belief is that marriages should be based on romantic love. And if you take those two together, those convictions lead to the conclusion that marriage and romance are, sent, are, are, are essentially incompatible. And I'm hearing it today from Hollywood stars and others who are out on TV always say that it is uh, cruel to commit people to lifelong connection after the inevitable fading of this romantic joy and emotion. And in fact, they said it's time to do away with the institution of marriage as, as we have defined it uh, from the uh, Christian perspective. And, but what would you expect? The things of God are foolishness of those uh, who are perishing, right? I mean, it's what it says. If you don't know Jesus, the things of God the, don't make sense. And, and if you're, you, you've got to be careful what you buy into because the biblical understanding of love doesn't rule out deep emotion. It really doesn't. A marriage devoid of passion and emotional desire for one another doesn't fulfill the biblical version, uh, vision. It really doesn't. But neither does the Bible uh, pit this romantic, emotional love against the essence of love. And the essence of love for a believer is sacrificial commitment to the good of the other sacrificial commitment to the good of the other. If we think of love primarily as emotional love and not as active committed service, then we end up pitting this duty and desire against each other. This idea of giving myself for the good of another, oh, it's going to mess up. I, I'm wanting this, this love, you see. But we so, we've, we've messed up love. This is what I'm trying to get across. We have sexualized every kind of love, uh, whether it be uh, affection, whether it be uh, philios, the friendship love. We've sexualized that now where you, we blurred the lines on that. Whether it's uh, eros, the sexual kind of passion, or whether it's even agape, we have... We've sexualized so much in, in that sense that we've lost the whole concept of, of love as being for the good of another in that sense. Uh, and so if we think of love as primarily an emotional desire and not as that committed service, we end up uh, destroying the lines uh, of what it means to love somebody and being willing to serve them uh, and be there for them for their good, and, and it ends up being unrealistic and, and very destructive. And that is a powerful, powerful thing uh, as it is. We get into uh, a lot of things we could say about that, but in sharp, in sharp contrast with our culture, the Bible teaches that the essence of marriage is a sacrificial commitment to the good of the other. Let me say that again. The, the, in contrast to this cultural view that it's all about that emotion, the Bible teaches that the essence of marriage, and, and this is what, why we need this particular kind of love, is a sacrificial commitment to the good of the other. That means that love is more fundamentally action than emotion. That, that love is more fundamentally action 
than love. But we have to be careful in this uh, or we end up with these traditional and more ancient views of marriage in, in which marriage was seen merely as a social contract or a transaction, if you will, uh, in order to preserve a family. It was a duty you did for society. And this traditional view makes the family the ultimate value in life. And so marriage in, in that perspective is just a mere transaction or contract that helped your family's interest. And then in our Western societies, like here in America, uh, we've made personal happiness, individual happiness, the ultimate value. And so when we talk about marriage, marriage becomes primarily an experience of romantic fulfillment, where that it makes me so happy in that thing. And it's more of that emotional feeling. Here's the difference. You've got a traditional that says it's about the family. You've got American contemporary culture that says it's about individual happiness. But then you have the Bible, and this is the point. This is the point that needs to be made with us who are believers, and this is it. In, in the Bible, when you read the Bible, the Bible sees God, sees God. Listen, sees God as the supreme good, not the, not the individual or the family. And when you get it from that perspective that God, it's about God, the supreme good, it gives us a view of marriage that intimately unites feeling, yes, we have feeling, and duty by love. Love compels us to serve and to give ourselves on behalf of another's good. And it, and it, it unites passion for another and the promise of God when we fulfill that. And this, that is because at the heart of the biblical idea of marriage is what's called covenant, is what's called covenant. And if you look throughout all of history, there, there uh, have always been consumer relationships. And I think that consumer relationship uh, idea is what is so prevalent right now in our Western society. What do I mean by consumer relationship? Well, a, a relationship will last only as long as the seller of something that you need uh, will meet your need at a cost that is acceptable to you. In other words, I'm going to buy from you if you are going to sell me something that is acceptable to me at a cost that's acceptable. But if another seller comes along and is willing to deliver better service at, the, at a better cost, then we feel like we don't have an obligation to stay in a relationship to the original seller. And so it's thus a consumer relationship. Um, and in that sense, it is said that the individual's needs are more important than a relationship. And I'm telling you, it is prevalent everywhere. It is prevalent everywhere. As long as you meet my needs, we're good. But at the moment, and, and, but if you want to charge me and I'm going to cost me more than I'm willing to give, man, I'm out of here, you know. But just as they've always been these consumer relationships, they've also been these covenantal uh, uh, relationships. And these relationships that are binding on us, they're binding. In a covenant, the good, the good of the relationship takes precedence over the immediate needs of the individual. You hear that? The good of the relationship takes precedence over the immediate needs of the individual. Uh, and that is big time. Now, if you listen to sociologists, sociologists argue that in the contemporary Western society that we have been so obsessed with marketplace ideas that that whole idea of a marketplace has been dominant. And so they are, are arguing, and I think rightfully so, that the consumer model 
remember the consumer model, now increasingly characterizes relationships, most relationships that at one time were about covenant, and those include marriage. Today, it seems that we stay connected to people as long as they're meeting our particular needs at an acceptable cost to us. I, I say it to a lot of people. Marriage to a lot of people I see today is like going steady in, uh, in high school or junior high. You mean, I'm going to go with you until some better guy or a better girl comes along and then I'm, uh, we're just going to break up and go on. There's no consequence. There's no commitment. We just, we just going together here, you know, we're just dating as it is. Uh, and so today we've brought that even in, that consumeristic idea into our relationships where we stay connected. I'm going to stay connected to you as long as you keep meeting my particular needs and it doesn't cost me more than I'm willing to pay. And, and the sad part is, is when we cease to make a profit, so to speak, when the relationship appears to require more love and affirmation from us than we're, than we're getting back, then we can cut our losses and drop the relationship. I remember on one occasion, uh, I was talking with a couple you know, years ago, and uh, the lady said, I am tired of giving, 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 and getting nothing back. I'm tired of it, and so... I don't, I, I'm here just to let you know I'm not really interested in counseling. I, I'm going to start looking out for number one. You remember what I talked about? Why do we fail self-centeredness? You said, well, it's justified. Well, you'd have to know the whole of the, the situation, but that's the idea. We just cut our losses and drop the relationship. And so in our society, the idea of covenant ha, ha, has all but disappeared in our culture. Um, and it's become foreign to us. Uh, but yet, if you read the Word of God, the Bible, you'll see that it is the essence of marriage. So we need to understand it. So I'm taking so much time. If you read the Bible at all, Old Testament or New Testament, you'll see that covenants are everywhere. They're everywhere. Horizontal covenants were covenants that were made between human beings. Uh, you can see them between close friends. 1 Samuel 18, verse 3. Then Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as his own soul. He made a covenant with him. There's two friends who loved each other like brothers, and they made a covenant between themselves. There, that also, that horizontal covenant is, is between nations. You can look at 1 Samuel chapter 20, verse 16, the first part of that. Uh, it says, and Jonathan made a covenant with the house of David. That's Jonathan and his people made a covenant with David and his people. But if you read the, the Bible, you see the most prominent type of covenants there are vertical covenants that are made by God with people, and with individuals and with people. With individuals, Genesis 17, 2, that I may make my covenant between me and you and may multiply you greatly, as well as families and peoples, Exodus 19, 5. Now, therefore, if you will attend and indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples. Those are covenants. One but with, was with Abraham that I read there in Genesis, and here you have that with his people of Israel. And so in several ways, the marriage relationship that Paul spells out here, and it's spelled out in the New Testament particularly, it's unique. And it, it is about covenant. It's a covenant relationship. Uh, and it is probably the most covenantal relationship that's possible between two human beings, marriage. It's marriage covenant. And so in Ephesians 5, verse 31, Paul brings up that, brings that up, this idea of covenant, when he fully quotes Genesis 2.24. Uh, and he says, for this reason, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. That's the first marriage ceremony. And Genesis 
the, in that Genesis text, if you go back and look at it, what, what he talks about, he used the word cleave, cleaving. And that's a, a, an old English term, which our, a lot of our translations have uh, translated united to. But the Hebrew word, and I've talked about this some in the past, literally means to be glued to something. If I brought that into our day, it would be to be welded to something. That the husband and the wife are welded together. And a good weld can make a piece of, two pieces of metal stronger than they ever were before. And so when you read the, uh, about uh, the word cleave in other places in the word of God, it, do, it means to unite to someone through a covenant or a binding promise or an oath, to be glued, to be welded to them through making a covenant or an oath with them. And so that's why, one of the reasons why that marriage is deeply about covenant relationship. Uh, and it's also because marriage has both this strong horizontal between two people, the husband and wife, and it has the vertical aspects to it as well. In Malachi chapter 2, verse 14, a man is told, that his, uh, is told that his wife is your partner, the wife of your marriage covenant. Your wife is your partner, yes, the wife of your marriage covenant. And then in Proverbs 2.17, it describes a wayward wife who has said, left the partner of her youth and ignored the covenant she made before God. You see, the covenant made between a husband and a wife, this is what Paul's trying to get across, that, that covenant made between a husband and wife is done before God and therefore with God as well as that husband or wife with which you're taking vows. And so to break faith with that husband or wife is to break faith with God at the same time. Now, this is the reason why when you look at so many traditional Christian wedding services, you always have, for the most part, a set of questions before you get to the vows. Questions like, will you have this woman to be your wife, uh, and will you make a promise to her in love and honor and all duty and service and all faith and tenderness to live with her and cherish her according to the ordinance of God in the holy bond of marriage, some, some similar to that. And each, each one, uh, the husband, the future husband, the future wife there, the spouse answers, I will or I do. Uh, but if you pay attention there, they're not speaking to each other right? Not at that point. In, in a way, they're technically looking forward and answering to me as a pastor, so to speak, as I ask them the question. They're, they're looking toward me. I will and I do. But if you understand what the questions are saying and you pay attention to them, what they're really doing is making a vow to God before they turn and make a vow to one another. In other words, when, when you ask him, will you take this person to be your wife, will you take this person to be your husband, and we go through those vow, those questions there, and they say, I will or I do, they're speaking vertically to God before they speak horizontally to each other. That's important for us to understand. They, they're getting to hear that husband or that wife stand before them and before God before their families, before a, a pastor of a church and, and state their loyalty and their faithfulness to them. And so if you build on that foundation, they then take one another by the hand and they say this to each other, I take you to be my lawful and wedded husband. I do promise and covenant before God and these witness to be your loving and faithful wife in plenty and in want, in joy and in sorrow, in sickness and in health, as long as we both shall live. And so the covenant with and before God strengthens the partners to make a covenant with each other. They said, I will, I do, and then they turn and say, and I will, I do with you. 
And so marriage, in that sense, is one of the deepest covenants, human covenants that God has designed. So what is that? What exactly is a covenant? Well, it's a relationship, honestly, that's far more intimate and personal than any legal or business relationship that you can think of. But yet, at the same time, it, it is lasting and, and binding and, and more unconditional than one that is built on just feeling and affection, right? It, it binds us more than just a fleeting feeling as it is. A, a covenant relationship is a, a stunning blend of the law, the legal part of it, uh, as well as love. This love that is willing to sacrifice on behalf of another. We, we have a problem one day, it seems to me, to see how any compatibility between uh, beauty and passion, you know, uh, duty and cash, uh, passion, I'm sorry, duty and passion. We can see the passion part. Oh, man. I, I just be honest with you. I mean, I, you ought to look at my wedding pictures. Uh, I hadn't been a Christian that long. A matter of fact, when we went to see the preacher, my wife said, we got to go talk to the preacher before we get married. I said, what for? And she said, well, you got to if you're going to get married in the church. And so I went, lost man. I'm standing before, I'm sitting before this preacher. And I was bored out of my skull, couldn't stand. I, I just thought, man, when's this thing going to be over with? And, you know, he, he, he told us this thing, you know, the family that prays together stays together. And I remember laughing. <laughs> I laughed. He said, is that funny? I said, it is, because I always thought it was the family that plays together. You know, I had other ideas about plays, and he probably thought I did, but it was that kind of thing. I was thinking, and this is what made me laugh. And he said, well, that's true, too. But a family that prays together, built around Jesus Christ, is who, la who laughs. And so that stuck with me. It really did. But I didn't understand all the intricacies even then that I'm telling you. But I, there's pictures of our wedding. And when we are, when we finally have been pronounced husband and wife, and we're going up that, that aisle and even out into the front of that, of that church, if you look at those pictures carefully, I've got my keys already in my hand. <laughs> I, I've, I've got them right there. I'm ready to go, man. I'm on the next part of the show. And all of a sudden, my wife says, what you got your keys for? I said, I'm ready to go. She said, we got to go in and have pictures. And I thought, dear father, what in the world do we need more pictures for? See? And it was, it was an interesting kind of conversations right out the chute. I mean, we, we do. We just can't hardly see how things work. We're more about that whole idea of, uh, of how in the world can you have beauty and how can you have this duty uh, that is all together. It, it just don't make sense in that way. It doesn't make how can you have a stimulating relationship unless it's just all about the feeling. But the biblical perspective uh, is, is really different radically in that because, you know, uh, listen, I know and I hope you know, if you don't, I hope you find out very quickly that love needs a, a, a strong framework, if you will, um, to build on, a, a, a binding obligation to make it fully what it should be. And so when you introduce covenant into the marriage, a covenant relationship is not just about uh, is just is not just about being intimate, despite being legal. It's a relationship that's more intimate because it's legal, huh? Yeah, it is. It's more intimate because it's legal. Why would that be? Well, it, that very standing there and being willing to say to God and before God, I am, I will, I I, I do. Standing before others and making a public marriage vow to fam before family and friends as it is to another person, that's enormous, I think, act of love in and of itself. Although there are some who are liars when they stand there. They had no intention, but they didn't know how to get out of it uh, before it happened. And that's sad in itself, and that's a sermon for another day. But... Uh, a wedding promise 
between two believers being filled with the Holy Spirit is a is proof that the that love the love there your love is actually at a marriage level as well as a radical act of self-giving all by itself I'm ready to be with you and to give myself to you for your good I'm willing to sacrifice my time I'm willing to sacrifice who I am in order for you and vice versa in that way but there's another way in which the I guess the legality of marriage are, uh, augments its personal nature. And some of you have a problem with the legality anyway. I don't need the state's approval. But if you go back and study New Testament marriage, you'll find out there were always legal documents. The engagement was a year, and it was you had to file for divorce to get out of it. It was uh, even at that point. It was a legal binding document. That's the reason they talk about a bill of divorcement in the New Testament. And so there's nothing that's changed uh, about that. So there is this uh, legality of marriage, and it augments or makes better, uh, you know, it, it through its, it, its own nature. Because when, when you're dating and living together, what do you have to do? When you're, when you're dating and living together, you're constantly having to prove your value. Constantly. You're, you're doing it daily. Why? I've got to keep impressing I got to keep impressing. I, I got to keep enticing. I got to impress you. I got to entice you. I got to impress you. I got to entice you. You have to show continually that there's chemistry. There's chemistry. And the relationship is fun and it's fulfilling or to be over. And so what, what we really are is what? In that consumeristic relationship. And that just means constantly making promises and constantly making promotion and constantly making mar uh, doing marketing. I'm going to market myself to you. I'm going to promote myself to you and to the point you know that you need me and want me. And, uh, but we found that majority of those situations and live in don't end well. Uh, but when you talk about the legal bond of marriage, it creates a space of security, if you will, where we can open up and reveal our true selves. We can be vulnerable to each other. And this is one of the things that I spend a lot of my time, and I, I may in, a, in the coming weeks talk about this more when I talk about communication and marriage. I find that most married couples, when I ask them, Do you, how's your communication? They say, oh, we communicate. But when I really question them on it, I realize they don't. They, they don't get vulnerable with each other. They don't become transparent with each other. They don't share what's really going on in here. And, and sometimes it's because they're criticized all the time when they start. You've got to be open. And, and it's more like asking questions. Of, Why do you feel that way? What caused those things? Getting to know each other deeper and deeper and deeper within that. And, and in that bond where we know that we're there, we can lay down the facades. We can take off the mask. We don't have to keep selling ourselves. We can lay the last layer of our defenses down and be completely naked, if you will, both physically and in every other way. Now, Janet and I are getting ready to have our uh, 45th anniversary coming up next month, June. 45 years, and before that it was three years of there uh i loved her when she was 15 i was 18 if i could have got her to marry me at 15 i would have those those years three years were rough though because i didn't know jesus but 45 years of marriage has it all been mountaintop uh angels singing and uh, no no it had but when i look back at the keys in my hand going out the door it's like I say to people, I love her more now than I ever could have thought I could love another human being. And at the moment with the picture, with my keys in my hand, I thought she ought to be thankful because nobody's ever going to love her like I'm loving her. But all these years later, as, as I have matured and learned the things I'm trying to, to share here with you, is is that is the very re reality is the, that you can be vulnerable you don't have to keep selling yourself there's a 
there's a preciousness when you can open up your heart and share and without being criticized and overwhelmed. Uh, you, you can love with a deeper love than just a physical, emotional kind of passion that we think that has to always be there. G.K. Chesterton, uh, who I really like, uh, he pointed out that when we fall in love, we have a natural inclination, not just, he says, not just to express affection, but to make promises to each other. Lovers, he says, finds themselves almost driven to make vow-like claims. I will always love you. And we say, we say those things when we are at the height of passion and we know that the other person, if he or she is in love with us, will, will want to hear those words. But, but it's got to go over that. It's, the, it, it's at the height of an emotional high, and it's not the reality of Jesus Christ in us where I'm not only live, I'm living for God first and living with you. You know, that's the reason why I like uh, when someone says, this is my wife, she's my second. This is my husband, he's my second. That's not degrading or downgrading. It's just simply to say that we both are living for God and his glory. You see, real love, uh, the Bible says, instinctively desires permanence. It desires permanence. Uh, listen to the Song of Solomon, which, which I've read at many weddings, ver chapter 8, verses 6 through 7, the first part of that. Uh, he says, set me as a seal upon your heart, as a seal upon your arm. For love is strong as death, jealousy is fierce as the grave. It flashes, it flashes or flashes of fire, the very flame of the Lord. Many waters cannot quench love, neither can floods drown it. it he says, man, you know, set, set me as a seal. It's the permanent. When he talks about an arm, like a tattoo, it's permanent in there. And it, it, it's in my heart. It's a seal of there, like the Holy Spirit is sealed us. And so when two people who have repented of their sins and trusted Jesus Christ as their Savior and Lord, and are seeking on a daily basis to pick up their cross, deny themselves, and follow after him, being filled with the Spirit. When two people genuinely love each other and are not simply using one another for sex or status quo or some kind of self-actualization, they don't want that situation to ever change. I mean... Each one wants the assurances of enduring commitment, and each one delights to give those assurances. And folks, I, 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 let me just interject here something that is so real to me and so powerful to me, and yet at the same time when I say it, I know there's so many people say, oh, it doesn't work. Jesus Christ in you and Jesus Christ in another human being can overcome any obstacle. Jesus Christ in me and Jesus Christ in my wife, as we yield to his leadership through the Holy Spirit, can help us overcome the hurts and the things we say, the things we do. Jesus Christ is where we win. It's where we win. And so... We love each other. We want the assurances of a, a permanence of being there. Uh, and wedding vows are not just a, a declaration, if you will, of present love, but mutually binding promise of future love. And so when you come to a wedding, it, it, should, it shouldn't be just primarily a celebration of how loving you are to somebody at that very moment because I'm hoping everybody can safely assume that. But rather in a wedding as you're standing before God and with God in Christ and before your family, etc., and you're promising to be loving and faithful and true to the other person in the future, Regardless of in, internal feelings or external circumstances, I mean, it's there. We're, it's a future thing. 
And so I say again that that all begins and is possible through an intimate love relationship with God through Jesus Christ and being filled with God the Holy Spirit and walking daily and living daily in and through him. Love is more than a feeling. It is an action. It includes feeling, but it is an action. My willingness, it is that form that you see in Jesus, willing to give himself for our good. I don't know where you are in your marriage or in your relationships because these principles of serving one another and loving in a way that is not dependent on what I get back all those are general principles of, of being a believer in Christ. But here's my thing to you. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord, you're just simply living in your own strength. And can you, you do it? I'm pretty sure you, there are some that have. But you will never fulfill what it was meant to be, and you will never experience what that fulfillment looks like or knows. Jesus Christ loves you. And it comes to that. Are you, do you know him? Do you really know? I'm not talking about religion. I'm not talking about doing religious things. There's some people think because they've done religious things. Baptized, here's a baby, you know, and I got confirmed here, and I did this, and I'm doing these religious things. Listen, it's not about religious things. They can leave you as empty as empty can be. It is about being filled up with Jesus Christ and his love by repentance of our sin and trusting in Jesus Christ and him alone. And if you've never done that, today is the day to do that. Today is the day to do that. So right where you are, wherever it is, just bow your head right there. If you don't know Christ, listen, just, just pray. Pray this way. Jesus, I am a sinner. I'm broken. I can't save myself. But right now, I'm asking you, Jesus, to forgive me of all my sins, for I'm turning to you. I may not understand it all, but what I do understand, and with the faith I do have, I put it in you, Jesus. I believe you died for me, was buried, and rose from the dead. Today, I ask you to save me and forgive me. Let your Holy Spirit come and dwell in me. And may from this moment on, I be your child. Help me to grow and mature as your child. Now tell him thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Thank you. Let us know that. Write it in the comments and say, man, I'm trusting Christ today as my Savior. Some of you who are praying are believers. And whether you've been blinded to your own self-centeredness or whether you've not refused to be vulnerable, whether you looked at love as more of what are you doing for me? You're not doing much for me, so I, you know, it's a consumeristic thing. Or is it about Jesus? Are you willing to serve that wife or that husband for their good? Are you willing to be vulnerable? Learn how to communicate. Learn how to confront. Just tell Jesus right now. Make a new commitment of your life. Jesus, I pray that you will forgive me for quenching or grieving your Holy Spirit in me and help me to be filled with his presence right now. And in the power of the Holy Spirit and the example of my Savior Jesus, help me serve. Call out their name. Help me serve him, her. Call out her name for their good. Help me to love them like you love me unconditional and some of you that are husband and wife together you need right now to ask God to forgive you how you've made your relationship be one more of opposite teams or a two opposing boxers in a ring 
and together commit your life to Jesus Christ and set the cross in the center of your marriage. Commit it to him. Father, we give you our marriage. Help us to live for you and to love for you. Help our marriage to be an example of what's possible in and through Jesus Christ. You tell him, pray it, make a commitment. Some of you who have gone through a divorce and maybe are single, and nobody will let you live down what you've gone through, you close your ears off to that because Jesus Christ forgives if you ask him. If you confess your sin, he forgives you. And if you've done that, listen, quit carrying it around. Let go of the shame, let go of the guilt. Let it go, let it go. And trust Christ and his forgiveness. And as you may seek or not seek someone in your life, seek that person that is in Christ, full of the Holy Spirit, that you know will be able to love you as he's supposed to be. Well, I know there's some hard cases. I know there's some people right now who you may want to turn this off or maybe they already have because they're hurting so bad because things have not gone good. Don't you stop living for Jesus even if someone else that you're married to has. Don't you do it. No, don't you do it. You live for Christ, come what may. Let Jesus and his love transform you. Oh, Father, I pray for all of those who are listening. I'm praying for every believer, whether they're married or not married, that they understand that in Christ we're to serve one another, we're to love one another. You tell us, love one another even as I have loved you. Serve one another. You set the example. Help us as believers to be loving and ser serving others and understanding that love is not just a sexual thing, that love is a giving of ourselves on the better half of others. I pray, God, you'd help us that help us. I pray you'll help those who are married, those who might even be separated, those who might be bitter from a divorce. I'm just asking you, God, to help them let it go and overcome all this in Jesus Christ and get back serving you, using their gifts, their talents to serve you and through others, to lead others to Jesus Christ. God, I pray right now for the healing that comes I'm praying for deliverance from those who are allowing hurtful habits and addictions to destroy their families. I'm praying that right now your Holy Spirit would grip their heart and right where they are, they would know, I'm laying this down. I'm letting it go. It is destroying me. It's destroying my family. And you make a new, fresh commitment to Christ. And if you've never trusted Christ, you trust him. Father, you bless right now. Let your name be exalted. Let our marriages grow strong, even in the midst of all that we're going through. I pray, Father, for every family that's watching. Help us know it all begins with you, Jesus. Jesus in me, the hope of glory. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. I love you, folks. God bless you. I hope you have a great Sunday.